the anger on the streets is not subsiding. After protests through the weekend, the slogans began again today at Sharif University, including one of death to the mullahs. There was a heavy security presence across Tehran and other cities, and activists have claimed that regime loyalists from the Basij militia beat and shot at them yesterday. But still they come out to protest. So is the action on the streets an existential threat to the system or simply a safety valve for a politicized elite? Mazar, not her real name, has told us about her forays to the protests. You know, with the governmental people, people from the regime and the police ones, and uh, a big crowd of them, still they were doing nothing, but they were focusing on the cars if anybody was taking a picture or not. They started to come and attack us, shoot fire on us, you know, with bullets and with tear gases and all of that. You can find everyone. You can find even from teenagers. You can find from students, university students. And also you can find mothers and fathers, people with old ages outside. who well, they do not want this regime anymore. 42 years living with the lies, with living with this dictatorship that we're done with it. As the tensions continue, the Iranian ambassador in London was summoned for a dressing down at the Foreign Office. That followed the detention yesterday for a few hours of his British opposite number in Tehran. Condemning that arrest today, the Foreign Secretary said the Iranian government is at a crossroads. The diplomatic door must be left open because ultimately the only way to permanently de-escalate, which I think the phrase used, is to have a diplomatic solution uh, to all of the issues from the nuclear front to the issue of Iran's destabilizing activities in the region and of course the dual nationals and many of the other bilateral issues. And we have been clear and we're consistently clear that that choice is there for the regime in Iran to make. And they can slip further into isolation with all of the uh, consequences that will have for the people of Iran or they can take the choice to come to the diplomatic, uh, uh, come through the diplomatic door, come to the negotiating table and then I believe that over the long term that is the only way all of these issues will be resolved. But Britain is also at a crossroads and seems to be choosing to keep faith with European allies over the nuclear deal or the rule-based international order, rather than siding more clearly with the Trump administration on Iran and indeed more widely. In an interview published yesterday, the Defence Secretary said US leadership couldn't be taken for granted and that the UK military needs to be more able to operate independently of America. Well, earlier I spoke to someone who's been at the coalface of diplomacy with Iran and indeed Western policymaking, Jeremy Hunt, who was foreign secretary until six months ago. I began by asking him if anyone seriously believes that President Trump can be brought back around to supporting the Iran nuclear deal. No, I don't think they do. And it is on its last legs and the clock is ticking. And the reality is it will probably take between 15 months and two years for Iran to develop fully-fledged nuclear capacity. And that is the ticking time bomb that we now face. Can we resolve the situation with Iran before it acquires nuclear weapons? Because the thought of Iran with nuclear weapons, whether that would provoke, for example, Saudi Arabia to have its own nuclear weapons, uh, the thought of nuclear weapons in the hand of, as we've seen, a very unstable regime is frankly terrifying. Do you think the breakout has started? I think they have started the process. They are already breaching the uh, uranium enrichment levels that the nuclear deal commits them to. And I think the critics of the nuclear deal, which I'm very pleased that we're still supporting, uh, they should remember that if that nuclear deal had not been in place, then Iran today would have nuclear weapons. And how much more toxic, how much more dangerous, how much more risky would the situation have been? So, so is there a diplomatic route now at all? Well, I think the question is, can we find a way to de-escalate the situation and to bring Iran back into the fold? Uh, the assassination of Soleimani was a huge risk, but it's a risk that potentially 
may have paid off if it, cause, if it causes Iran's government to step back and creates a window of opportunity. My own view is that they are unlikely to seriously negotiate with the United States until after the US presidential campaign. They know they're going to be dealing with Trump, if it is Trump. But that then creates a very short window in which to do a deal. And Perhaps before they have the bomb. Before they have the bomb. And that will create the pressure from their side. Uh, from the United States' side, they will have a president with a, a mandate for another four years. And that is what we and the rest of the world have got to hope happens. And when you look at the signs of instability, uh, serious problems in, in back in uh, November where they switched off the internet while they carried out a violent repression are now re-emerging. Do you think that makes them more or less likely to want nuclear weapons? I think they are now going to feel that they need to have nuclear weapons to show the United States that it's paid a price for the economic sanctions that are so crippling for them. So I don't think there's a, a deep desire to have nuclear weapons for the sake of them because, frankly, they're the weapons you're least likely to actually use. But I think they are now likely to make progress in that direction. And that adds to the uncertainty. The thing about the Middle East is that the unexpected does happen, as we've seen. You're not pinning any great hopes on, on the survival of the nuclear deal. But for the time being, Boris Johnson is still lining up with Germany and France on this. And that would confound people who were saying in the election, oh, he'll do anything to get a trade deal with with Donald Trump. I mean, how do you think he's playing this? Well, I think he's playing it very wisely because he's saying that Britain is an independent sovereign nation. We take a view uh, that is our own view. It's the British view. And uh, Boris was foreign secretary, supported the Iran nuclear deal because, like me and like Philip Hammond, uh, all the foreign secretaries of that period recognise that uh, the Middle East is safer if Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons. Uh, but uh, the crucial role that Britain can play is that if there is one European country that always has a, an open audience with the president, an open door to the White House, it's us. And we have the ability to give advice in private uh, that is sometimes not possible for other countries to do. And so Don't the advice we're giving to calm things down, I think, may be very, very important. Don't you think, though, that, that, that there's a sort of vanity in thinking that you might be the Trump whisperer? I mean, wasn't that the mistake that Emmanuel Macron made as well? Well, I think there is a vanity in thinking, in overstating our influence. Um, and, um, but it's also a mistake to think that we have no influence at all. But the mistake that not just us, but many other Western countries are making at the moment is not to see the fragility in the Western alliance. We've got uh, an alliance of democracies uh, underpinned by NATO that has essentially set the rules in the world since the Second World War. That is now fraying. And it's fraying because American taxpayers and people like Donald Trump are saying it's just not fair that we're spending 4% of our GDP on defense and you Europeans at best are spending 2%. And they're saying, just what does Europe do for us? And it's difficult to answer that question. But does it mean, as uh, Defence Secretary Ben Wallace was suggesting in an interview at the weekend, that increasingly it's, it's what he calls the thought that keeps him awake at night, uh, you cannot rely on American leadership with enormous implications for the security of this country, how much it spends on defence, who its natural allies are? Well, I think it was very courageous of Ben Wallace to say that, but actually the right thing to say, and it's something that keeps me awake as well, because American commitment to leadership of the Alliance of Democracies is weaker than it's been for some time, because they don't think that it's a fair deal at the moment. And what they see from Europe is a lot of complaints about what America does, why is America selling all these weapons to Saudi Arabia, all this kind of thing. And they don't see the commitment from Europe to play its part. In fact. American taxpayers, American taxpayers are probably paying around a third of the cost of defending Europe. Isn't and that is something that, you know, we shouldn't underestimate how much oh, that irks the administration. OK, it's, it's unsustainable, as, as many American defence secretaries have said. But where does it leave this country in relationship to its European neighbours? I mean, just at the moment uh, that the UK is about to exit the EU, 
We find ourselves lining up with Germany and France on the nuclear issue, potentially with Germany on the Huawei, the, the Chinese uh, 5G technology, on all sorts of questions, being closer to Europe in our perspective than we are to the United States. I mean, does this make it all rather awkward, the fact that Brexit is about to happen, or does it actually make it even more necessary? Well, I think it makes it more necessary, because if you look at our historic role over the last uh, 70 years, over the last 100 years, we've been the bridge across the Atlantic that has brought European countries and the United States together. And if there is one country that can bind together the leading democracies of the world, it's Britain. But if we're going to do that, we've got to have something to bring to the table. We've got to have uh, better military than we have now. Our military are fantastic, but they are struggling to meet the commitments they, they now have. At the moment, the interest in Washington in that leadership role is waning. And therein lies huge dangers. In 10 years' time, for the first time in our lifetimes, the largest economy in the world may not be a democracy. And that will have profound implications on our confidence as Western countries. The need for democracies to stand together to defend the values that we believe in has never been stronger. And that's why I think Ben Wallace pointing out that we can't take American leadership for granted is courageous and right. Jeremy Hunt, thank you very much. Thank you.